Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Outside Insider podcast here on Philly Sports Network with myself Liam Jenkins. You know the score by now. All things Eagles related from the last seven days. Ordered on Uber Eats, delivered in a Volkswagen Passat to your front door by a lovely man named Timothy. This is the show that will go over everything Eagles related in a slightly different way. So if you're new around here, make sure you're subscribing to the podcast. We are just about everywhere these days. I think we're finally on Google Play or the other Android one. We're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Spreaker, iHeartRadio and all good podcast providers. If you are listening on YouTube, and again, I know there are, I would say, hundreds of you. There might, it might be the same person doing it 700 times. But if you are one of those YouTube people, leave a like, hit subscribe, maybe just go onto the Apple Podcast website, leave a lovely five-star review, because we can't grow without those, and it would mean a lot. What a week it's been. It's not been the biggest week, it's not been the busiest week, but in terms of rumours and hearsay and, and stuff to take into the run towards OTAs, there's certainly plenty of weight. And at Philly Sports Network especially, I know our content has hopefully reflected that, just planted some seeds in your gentle minds and spoken about some key points and storylines heading into the coming months. And that will also be spoken about, of course, during Thank You Next, a nice bumper edition this week. But today is a special day. I've purposely recorded this episode a little bit earlier than usual, but it will go out a little bit later than usual. Purely because my favourite soccer team, Charlton Athletic, they play in a playoff game today. If they win, they play in another playoff game at a bigger stadium, so it's, it's quite important. But the thing is, if they lose, and I had to record this podcast after that... I'd be an emotional wreck and I'd get very angry and I don't think you're ready for another Ronald Derby rant. So if this podcast... Oh, it's not going to be worth me trying to promote the game, is it? But it'll be fun either way. So I'm all hyped up. I'm excited. I'm sat here. And that means we carry that energy into our first debate. And of course, there's only one place we can start and that is a sudden rise in speculation and reports that there is a big contract extension coming. It's like someone out of nowhere is just connected. Hang on, the Eagles have $21 million of cap space. Hang on, Carson Wentz is going to be entering what would have been a contract year if not for that option. Wow, maybe they should extend him. However, I think there's a little bit more weight to this. Because if you look at where the news is coming out from, they're bigger sources. It's not your local guys close to the team. Now, if a contract extension report I found come out from someone in the local beat, one of your beat writers, one of the guys that's plugged in, then what you typically see is that contract extension happen or something very similar or everything gets expedited a little bit because they've heard from something that's currently in progress. Typically, if it's nationally, and I don't want to... National guys get it instantly the moment it happens because they have access to everything ever, but I've noticed that if they speak of something... It's almost like it's trying to drum something up, right? Like if a free agent hasn't signed a contract in weeks and he's still there, they go, oh, this guy's just worked out for a, for a team. They're, he's bloody working out. He is to try and drum up a market, right? I've got a sneaky suspicion that given the nature of where these reports are coming from, which are national reporters going on local radio a lot of the time, I think it's a reaction. I think the Eagles are having to react. And either they're trying to do one of two things, which is A... Get the Cowboys to commit to Dak Prescott early so they can pay Wentz less. Or B, jump the gun and outdo the Cowboys. This isn't new. This is not new at all. If you look at any free agency move at all from about the past three years with this Eagles regime, the one thing they all have in common is that Howie Roseman, he likes to play the field a bit. He likes to jump the gun. He li- I mean, look at the Malik Jackson signing. When you've got a plethora of dominant pass rushers, some of whom still remain unsigned, others have been signed to monumental deals. You want to jump the gun, get in early, and set the expectation. When the Eagles extended franchise right tackle Lane Johnson, when they extended tight end Zach Ertz, they did so to jump the gun, knowing what the market's going to look like, and knowing that it's going to suddenly jump up. Even Fletcher Cox, we saw exactly the same thing with Fletcher Cox when he was signed. The Eagles jumped the gun, they got in early because they want, they'd rather set the bar than let someone else overpay and then have to do it for them. If you're Dak Prescott right now, and let's be honest, a perfectly mediocre quarterback in every sense of the word, and you sign a big deal, you know, you're going to get, I don't know, let's say 30 million a year, I don't know, something, let's, for average's sake, alright, 30 million a year, whatever. 
Carlson Wentz, no matter what Dak Prescott signs, is going to look at that and go, hang on a minute, if Dak's getting that much, then I deserve this much. And that's just common logic. So what the Eagles are going to have to do is either say, right, we, we bite the bullet and we pay Carson Wentz now, or we let the Cowboys overpay and see what happens to the market. And either way is a risk. So I feel like they're just putting out feelers. It wouldn't surprise me if uh, an off-season move is committed between now and training camp. But it just feels a little bit too convenient that after weeks of hearing Jerry Jones and the Cowboys and Dak Prescott's extension and the bizarre wars that have seen Dak versus Wentz, who are always going to be the comparisons despite their clear disparity in form and production, that the Eagles have suddenly just gone, oh, okay, let's let's talk about signing Carson Wentz to a big extension. This was always going to happen. I've said this since the beginning of the offseason, that if the Eagles are going to pay Carson Wentz, if they see him as the true face of this franchise, they've got to pay him now. There's There's no other option. This is the only time the Eagles will ever, well, I'd say ever, I mean this contract window, have value. In Carson Wentz. And by value, I mean what you pay is less than what you get, if that makes sense. Sort of like, you know, you put a £5 bet on and you win £300. That is value. If you're going to put £5 to win £7, not good value. And this is what this situation is like in a very bizarre gambling orientated (laughs) sense. Because right now, there are two sides to Carson Wentz. And the Eagles have a tremendous amount of leverage negotiating a deal to make Carson Wentz become that $200 million man is so difficult. His play, while it's been exhilarating, is erratic and careless at times, and with two season-ending injuries, he hardly exactly promotes a really reliable image. And as we know, as me being the vivid future owner of the Motor Trends truck of the year 2019, the Chevy Dodge Ford Ram 7, I am all about reliability. But if you want to get value, you're not paying, you're paying for upside. And Carson Wentz, as we know, is coming off two season ending injuries, an ACL and a back issue, which I think this two to this day is still linked. But if the Eagles don't sign him right now and Wentz goes into a full off season with his offensive coordinator, who he didn't have last year, if we roll back 12 months, Mike Grow, the offensive coordinator taken over from Frank Reich, was working with Nick Foles at the centre point of that offence. From training camp, OTAs, all the way through week three of the regular season, the offence was built around Nick Foles. And I don't mean in terms of talent, I mean in terms of the plays that were run. Wentz comes back in, the most important relationship on the team is nowhere near as strong as it could be, because the two haven't had a chance to work together in that capacity just yet. Now you're going to have a full off season working with quarterback and offensive coordinator, where there is a clear QB one. There's no ifs, buts and maybes here about who's going to start and when. You're going to have Deshaun Jackson, who unexplainably is certainly better than Tory Smith or Mike Wallace. There is no... You you can't fight that. The Eagles finally invested at wide receiver two after I think that they should have done for many, many years right now. They've tried Dorio Green back in, we've tried Traggs, Gibson, Smith, Wallace, it doesn't matter, they needed to invest something substantial. You then have Nelson Aguilar still on the team, which is huge. You then have a tight end package where, uh, for instance, Dallas Goddard, I believe, of the five receptions caught last year, three of them were touchdowns inside the red zone. The guy's a monster. You've got Goddard, Ertz, Arcega Whiteside and Jeffrey as a red zone package with Jordan Howard there. There is no feasible way that if Carson Wentz plays anywhere close to the level of 2017, he doesn't have a Pro Bowl season, he doesn't have a year worthy of an MVP award. You can look at Patrick Mahomes, I think you're going to see a catch up to him, that's typically what happens with eccentric young quarterbacks that the league will catch up in time and you'll see those numbers just drop slightly, not substantially but enough to bring him back to somewhat normality because at the minute the man is a god. But Carson Wentz, through everything, through every injury, every setback, every missing piece of the offence, every excuse, none of that exists now and if Wentz goes into next year with an offence that dangerous and plays either, I mean, week 13 against Washington last year, I was watching the tape last night for the film room coming up on Zach Brown, I think that's the best I've seen him in 2018, and that game would have been nearly a year since the ACL tear, so about as healthy as he ever would have been, 
barring the the back spasms where he's now walking like Herbert the pervert from Family Guy. But that, to me, was a sign of things to come. Apart, apart from that interception, which was stupid, the game was nearly perfect. The throws he was making were incredible. I really feel like, at this point in time, if Carson Wentz is everything that fans, that coaches, that media believe he is, there is no way he is anything less than excellent in 2019. And if that is the case, if you don't extend him this year, you're then paying for what you've already got, which is a franchise quarterback who balls out and has an absolutely incredible season. If you fast forward 12 months and the Eagles have just paid his option year, you're having to extend him based on what could be another 45 touchdowns, another 65% completion percentage, God knows how many yards. Is that the risk you want to take? It, given the strength of this schedule, the intimidation of the offense, and every other factor, if you think that... I mean, anyone not named... Oh, I'm trying to think of a poor quarter. I don't want to say Dak Prescott, because that downplays the whole argument. But let's be real. If you're a top 15 quarterback playing in that offense, who has somewhat of a dual threat skill set, you're going to succeed. It's simple. It's But then you've got to look at what are the Texans going to do with, uh, with Deshaun Watson? What are the Cowboys going to do with Prescott? Again, this is the only window. If one of those quarterbacks gets signed first, Wentz is at a dis- same with Jared Goff. Wentz is at a disadvantage. Well, I'd say Wentz is at a very good advantage. He's going to be an absolute baller and trade in those khaki shorts for some nice off-white skinny jeans. <laughs> I just feel that if you're the Eagles, the only window of value is now. Because you can sit down with Carson Wentz and say, look, you haven't shown us reliability. You've had two season-ending injuries. You've flashed that elite potential. You're still playing reckless. We are going to pay for what we think we're going to get. We will incentivize the hell out of that deal. We will add snap count incentives, playoff incentives, Super Bowl incentives. Stop giving the ball to Zach Ertz. No, we're not going down that road. (laughs) That's the way to do it. There is no other way. And you've got to ramp that up. Because if you don't bite the bullet now. And Dak Prescott gets an absurd deal. And then Deshaun Watson as a result gets an absurd deal. And then Carson Wentz gets an absurd deal. The Eagles who are already backloading contract after contract. Like they're trying to avoid the big angry tax man. Are going to struggle. This has to be the moment. The Eagles signed Carson Wentz to a contract extension. And the way I liken this to, you've waited for a bad analogy. You've had 30 minutes of a, a talk thinking, wow, where's Liam's bad analogy about this? It's got to be somewhere. Here it is. I'm a man of class. You may or may not know this. When I go and do my food shopping now, it is often around 11.59 in the evening before the supermarket shuts at 12pm. Why do I shop so late, you may ask? One, because my body clock's broken and I'm trying to work on an American time zone. But two, and the main reason behind this sorcery and absolute tomfoolery, is that the reduced aisle exists. Now, I don't know if you have these in America, but the reduced aisle is a safe haven. It is the aisle of God. It is where the men get separated from the boys and where timing is everything. Because for all products, be it dairy, bread, meat, food that's going out of date... Anything that has been damaged during that day. Maybe someone dropped a box of cereal. Oh no, the box is damaged. We'll reduce it by 50%. And we've got to sell it because otherwise it's just been thrown away. So that reduced aisle becomes this haven of value food that otherwise you're paying double, triple the price for. You can get a pack of 12 yogurts for like 70 pence. And that is just good value. So I go there once a week. Basket in hand, and I scan through. Sometimes I get lucky. I find a nice chicken tikka masala. Other times, someone's beat me to the post. And I've got to pay full price for that chicken tikka masala. And let me tell you, it does not taste anywhere near as good. Now that I've spent £5.99 on a dish, it could have saved me. I could have spent £1.50 on it. Howie Roseman is scanning that reduced aisle. And there are two other members looking at it. And they're all lying up the same dish. Now, that you can get that dish in another aisle, but you're paying full price. Howie Roseman wants value. He does not want Jerry Jones to snatch that away. 
It is a nice chicken tikka masala, let me tell you. When you walk out of that supermarket, now and you have spent next to nothing, and you have got value for days, there's no feeling like it. And the Eagles will never have that feeling again if this off-season pans out in a way where Dak Prescott is signed first, maybe even Deshaun Watson signed second. The Eagles have the cap space. They've got $21 million to play with. That will at least give you maybe a shortened first year, incentivize that first year. That's the most important, if we're brutally honest, looking at his recent history. This is all about value now. And it does not surprise me in the slightest that all these reports are coming out that Carson Wentz is going to break the bank for the Eagles because it's going to force the Cowboys to either underpay, and go, oh, that's too much, or overpay. Or they're just driving up the market, driving up the tension, and they're going to pip everyone else to the post, just like they did with Cox, just like they did with Johnson, just like they did with Ertz. This is what Howie Roseman does. So do not be surprised if in the next few weeks or the next couple of months, you do see Carson Wentz signed to a big-time contract extension. Because again, if you let it all hang in the balance and he balls out and he puts up Pro Bowl numbers and has an incredible season, which we all know he's capable of, you're then paying for a full price chicken tikka masala when you wouldn't buy it normally. You want the value. You want the reduced one where the packaging's a bit dented so you pay 50p. That is the tea. I'm spilling it. If I'm Harry Roseman, it's a no-brainer. You sign Carson Wentz and you do it as soon as you possibly can. But what do you think, guys? Let me know in the comments if you're on YouTube. You kind of can't do that if you're on Apple Podcasts. However, what you can do is submit me questions for next episodes. Thank you, next. You can do that through my Twitter page, at LiamJenkins21, where each week I ask you for your input, your questions about all things Eagles and sometimes non-Eagles related. And let me tell you, we have got a few to get through here today. We're going to start things off our favourite time of the show with the man who's always in my dms now folk jd has become the staple of thank you next i hope you're strapping yourselves in we've got a lot to get through here we go probably the biggest thank you next ever i may say thank you next folk jd in capitals says does the cody kester signing say anything about Wentz's health and is this reason for concern do i see him making the final roster I don't think it's about Carson Wentz's health. If I'm honest, I think it's a a lack of veteran leadership. Carson Wentz is the oldest guy in that room right now. You've got behind him, Luis Perez, Nate Sudfeld. And not even Luis Perez anymore, he's gone. So it's just Nate Sudfeld and Clayton Thorson. Wentz is then leading that room. You still kind of want someone that can come in with NFL experience. And even though he's only been in the league a few years, Cody Kessler has played in over 16 NFL games. That's a year's worth of starting experience. It makes sense. He's not a tier one quarterback. He's marginally a tier two quarterback. But I think that he brings enough there to maybe just give Nate Sudfeld the fear, give him the the hunting signal, make him step up his pace a little bit, maybe rag the horse a bit more going in towards that final stretch. And while he's not an immediate danger to Sudfeld, I do feel that that experience is going to help Clayton Thornton and overcome some of those issues that he currently has. Thank you. Next, what do I think Timmy Jernigan's Instagram story was all about? Of course, if you missed that, that was where Timmy Jernigan threatened to pull a Telvin Smith. And I made a video on, I think it was this week in Philadelphia Sports, um, where I featured that story a bit more prominently. And I had people just commenting saying, oh, he, he replied to another Eagles fan account saying that everything's fine and he loves the Eagles and I'm like that's lovely that's lovely but pulling a Telvin Smith doesn't mean going for an 18 round you know 18 a whole round of golf does it it just does not mean going to Wagamama's you don't have Wagamama's so we'll say Wendy's going to Wendy's and buying a burger with a friend it doesn't mean going out and buying a nice car pulling a Telvin Smith he knew exactly what he was saying he's not an idiot he's probably been pulled up by the Eagles PR staff who've gone Timmy what the hell are you doing rein it in everyone thinks you're leaving it's going to cause an unnecessary storm of absolute turd so sort it out and he's gone on to a reasonably sized Eagles fan page and gone sorry fly Eagles fly like behave Timmy Jernigan it's grow up a little bit it's not on I I feel like he's kind of overstepping a mark there he's tried to be a little bit vocal about his situation where I said in the video he's not happy about playing time he knew the situation going in you can't walk in to a farm where you know it's gonna stink of like cow turd and then complain it stinks of cow turd you wanted the farm you walked on the farm 
you know, you made your bed sleep in it. So thank you next is where we're going to go from there. But now we move on to the guys in my mentions. And oh, this is going to be a fun one. So let me just scroll down the timeline. because We've got a couple today. The first one coming from at PhillyStrong91. What corner and pick would you give for Chris Harris or Patrick Peterson? And do you think the value would be worth it? Ah... Uh... Well, I mean, Patrick Peterson's got his own problems right now, so we'll leave him out of the equation. As for Chris Harris, mm, none, because I think the Eagles have already got a stable cornerback core for now, at least. I mean, this would have made sense if they didn't already bring back Ronald Darby for one year. Unless you're going to trade Ronald Darby, then no, like, I'm not interested. There's no point. You're trying to build something for the future, clearly. So... I don't know. It's a weird... In this current situation, given that the Eagles have Avante Maddox, given that we still don't know what we have in Sidney Jones, given that we still don't know what we have in Rasul Douglas because the Eagles just refuse to play him, and he's bulked up. Have we just spoken about the Rasul Douglas glow-up? Go on Rasul Douglas' Instagram. He looks like he's marketing one of those knockoff fruit pills that your 35-year-old friend sells on Facebook, saying, oh, buy my fruit text ink now to shave £7 in a week. He's just put that on. I, he's just got a six pack overnight and I don't know what's happened so that's a thing but yeah as of right now I, I certainly see the appeal in Chris Harris and Patrick Peterson but this isn't a team trying to win now they already are winning now and they've got a young cornerback corp so I think if I'm honest it just makes sense to play Maddox and see what you've got out there because after this offseason maybe we'll talk about it as of right now there's no reason to really shake things up you don't rock the apple cart if the apple cart doesn't need rocking uh, thank you. Next, uh, Tom Idzinski says, If Sudfeld has an awesome preseason, what's the likelihood of him being traded? Good question. I don't think there's much likelihood at all, though, purely because the Eagles want him as their QB2. The only instance he would get traded, if, if they're very comfortable with Cody Kessler, but then that defies the object of their little quarterback conveyor belt that they've got going. So I, I kind of don't think that's going to be a thing. Um, it, it's a good question to ask, but I do feel that uh, Nate Sudfeld is going to just be a, uh, a kind of mainstay in this Eagles roster now. He's going to be your quarterback two moving forward. Uh, thank you. Next, uh, Mike Marich says, how do you think Game of Thrones ends this weekend? Now, I would have said something completely different, but I just saw um, the most bizarre conspiracy theory at 5am, which is just how YouTube works, isn't it? You start out watching a nice Eagles video, you end up watching top 10 pyramids that can also provide running water to a legion of thousands at 7 in the morning. Um, but this was interesting. So it's a theory that Littlefinger didn't die. And that there's a scene in season 7... Sorry, spoiler alert, if you've not watched it yet. There's a scene in season 7 where Littlefinger gives off this little bit of paper to a woman who seemingly tells him that his time is up. The idea is that that bit of paper is actually an iron coin of Bravos, and the woman took the place of Littlefinger, so Littlefinger didn't die, Littlefinger is still alive, and is going to basically come and take the Iron Throne, which I love. Like, I mean, that is a great theory. There's loads of stuff linking back to the books about him being a light bringer or something like that. But yeah, I, that's my wildcard theory, and I stand it fully. I think Littlefinger sitting on the Iron Throne going, Santa, the Iron Throne waits for two of us. Like, he's got a weird voice. I mean, that would put me off. If he just comes back and goes, Daenerys, my queen, I'm here for Santa. And together, we are rule all of Westeros. I can't deal with that. But the actual premise of this being such a terrible, terribly written season that's been rushed to no end, and then to have the biggest plot twist ever of Lord Baelish coming back, Lord Baelish coming back and ruling the Seven Kingdoms, it'd just be great. I, I stand that fully, so I, I'm going with that. Uh, Mike also asks, thank you next, LJ, I was listening to the podcast in the car with my girlfriend, and she said... How can you listen to this? His voice hurts my ears. She really said this. Should I break up with her? At least you know she's sane. At least you know she's sane. You know, I would be very stunned if she listened to this in the car and was it wasn't freaked out and wasn't wondering why you're listening to a 12 year old child talking about the eagles it just wouldn't make sense so 
I'd say wifer, if I'm honest, but on a conditional rule, as I said to you on Twitter, you've got to play this podcast during every Friday night session of lovemaking for the considerable future. It's the only way. Um, although, if anyone is listening to this and a significant other or any friend has accidentally heard this on the Orcs Court in a car, let me know what they think of this atrociously prepubescent voice. I'm very intrigued. And that rule still stands where if you can send video evidence of you getting someone else to listen to this podcast, I will send you a free t-shirt. So th- the rule is there. Thank you. Next, we've got three more to go. Alfonso745894410 says, Can you predict the Eagles record? By the way, I love your work. Thank you, Alfonso. That's very kind of you to say. Um, can I predict the Eagles record? I certainly can. I'm going to say 13-3 and three, with the three losses being one against the Cowboys, one against the Seahawks, and uh, I don't know. It'll be some. It'll be the third loss. Will be one that they should win. It will just be a game they should really, really not be losing. So a trap game. We'll, we'll just put it there. Maybe the Dolphins. I could see that happening. Eagles go to Miami. Little summer lads on tour and just get absolutely bombed out by whatever team Miami have got left. Really. So there's that. Uh, thank you. Next, Ben Vega says. You don't live in the Philly area, so some of my friends get mad at me when I say we when referring to the Eagles because it's not I that owns the team. Should I find new friends? No, but I can see where they're coming from because there's this same argument in England, England's, you know, in English people when we talk about football teams and they're like, oh, we are, oh, we should have scored two that game. It's like, oh, we, we were on the pitch, were you? Uh, we. Like, I mean, I think maybe it's just because being a journalist, you can't associate with the team as we. You're trying to do it from... Uh, an unbiased and quite a neutral standpoint. So for me to sit there and say, we should do this, we should do that, aligns myself with the team. So I guess if you're aligning with the team, fine. But I would never say it being a journalist because it just doesn't make sense for me to say because I'm not part of that organisation. I'm not saying we should do this, we should do that. I'm trying to say the Eagles should do this, the Eagles should do that because that's my objective view. As a fan, it's it's hit and miss, it's particular. You can make an argument for both cases without a doubt, but I I wouldn't get angry at you. I would make a passive-aggressive comment because that's my humour, and I'm very sarcastic, and that's just the way the cookie crumbles, unfortunately. But um, as for anyone in Philadelphia, I mean, the majority of American sports fans, as far as I'm aware, say we about themselves and the team anyway, so... I wouldn't kick off that much. But in England, I do it to wind up my friends all the time just because it's quite funny. So, have it for what it's worth. I think you can make an argument both sides. Thank you, next. We have got ourselves. The final question in Thank You Next comes from Ted Buriani. And Ted has been, again, a long listener of the show. He has got himself some PSN merch. He is one of the OG Philly Sports Network members, the outside insider crew. We still had a nickname, didn't we? We were going to call you all Toy Boys and we decided against it. See, I said we as a collective (laughs) because it just sounds... I can't imagine having printed merchandise where I put Toy Boy on it with T-O-Y as the abbreviation. But we'll we'll come up with some new collective plan, I'm sure. Ted says, give me your best Patrick Peterson (laughs) package and your Lewis Capaldi album review. So I've not listened to the full album yet on Lewis Capaldi, but I do think he is the smartest man in music at the moment. Why? Because if anyone knows Lewis Capaldi and his global takeover, the guy started out with nothing and overnight blew up. Because his Instagram stories, his Twitter is so self-deprecating, it's so genuine. Whereas what you see in music a lot of days, a lot of time, is people just being fake. Oh, I'll swipe it right now, listen to my new song. Right, and that doesn't help anyone. No one is any more intrigued. It just seems so corporate. And music is very corporate. No matter what band you listen to, every interview seems the same. What Lewis Capaldi is doing is making it genuine. It's just a kid having fun, being as funny as he can, and enjoying every moment. And people are relating to that. And then he puts out heartbreaking bangers, which I relate to, let's be honest, because we went through a solid six months of this show mentioning the same girl every pissing weekend. So sorry about that. But, you know, you have to do what you have to do. And I feel like that's what I've genuinely tried to do a little bit as well. Like, this podcast specifically is a lot more... It's a lot more LJ than it is me being a writer and having to put up that front of of putting out content or kind of maintaining that super professional suited reputation. And now because I'm my own boss, I can kind of... I don't know, let the strings go a bit, have some fun. I won't drop a soppy speech, but I... As a person, I love what Lewis Capaldi's doing because I relate to it a lot and I think it's the best way to interact with people today. Um, this 
this thank you next has gone on a while, isn't it? I'm sorry about that. But I do think that his album's probably going to be very good if it's more filled with heartbreak bangers. So I'll give it a listen this weekend. I'll let you know next week. Best Patrick Peterson trade package would be a non-existent one because I just... No, I don't know. The Eagles can't trade for a cornerback who's going to miss the first six games of the season. I mean, that's basically... Ronald Darby take two. Am I right? But um, let's uh, let's not go down that road uh, again. But obviously, it's to, to do him with like you know a test and that sort of thing. And he's known about it for ages. He's been telling different outlets that he was aware of it. So I don't know. I wouldn't give anything up for him. It just let him set it out and see if he rebounds or not. But that is it. But thank you, next guys. If you want to send your questions for next week's show. At Liam Jenkins 21. Now, I don't mean that's the at sign, then at Liam Jenkins 21. I mean it is the at sign, Liam Jenkins 21. That would be great. So, thank you very much for all of your questions. We've got one more topic, as always, with this show to talk about before we close the curtains and I go downstairs and sing Ale 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 for the next 90 minutes or so. So, that's going to be fun. But before we close up shop, there's one man we need to talk about. That hasn't been spoken about in quite some time. Kevin Hogan. No, I'm kidding. We're going to be looking at Sidney Jones. And I've just put an article out about this today on phillysportsnetwork.com. Because this is now, ultimately, a now or never season for Sidney Jones. And the only way I can position this, you know we're going to go straight back to a bad analogy. If you look at the complexion of the Eagles secondary right now. Jalen Mills is a free agent next year. Ronald Darby is a free agent next year. And that is the bet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sidney Jones now has a very natural path to potentially attain a starting role. Lovely. But, again, Liam analogy fashion. We've got to go all in. This is what you come for. This is the tea. Let's say you're in the DMs with a lovely lady or man. You know, we're, we're not discriminating here whatsoever. There could be ladies listening to this show. There could be guys who swing that way. Whoever you are DMing. As long as it's not an animal, that would be very weird. That's that's where we draw the line, all right? No actual eagles will be DM'd in the process of this show. But if you're DMing a girl and she gets a bit off and she gets a bit cold with you and starts just give, giving you the hard shoulder, you pull out. You're like, I'm not going there again. You, you've messed it up. Well done. You had high potential. You matched on Tinder. She gave you the blue star and you messed it up. But she then starts liking your pictures and you come back. And for the first few paragraphs of that conversation, you are killing it. And then, then you, you, it goes wrong again. It goes wrong again. This time, though, you go on a date. You go on a date and you choke it and you do what I did, you know, with my, my last proper relationship, which is on the first date, went up to her, went to say, her hair looks nice, and I said, is that your hair? Is that your hair? Absolutely ruined it, Right? You balls it up again. But then, this is your third time now. And somehow she is still in the DMs. But if you mess it up this time, there is no going back. There is no redemption. She's wanted to well, she's wanted to see you again. She's called you over. Netflix and chill and the show you will be ro- watching is so substanceless and pointless that you can just get by and get down to the nitty gritty. I'm, of course, talking about Rick and Morty. Shots fired. So... What do you do? If you mess it up this time, you're not ever going to take that further. But if you can somehow redeem yourself, that could be potential wifey material. Can you get it done? That is what Sidney Jones is looking at this year. You're going to have two players outwardly in trouble. Ronald Darby, Jalen Mills, both players Pending free agents, contract year, need big years. After that, it's open season. Howie Roseman can sit down and say, right, now we're not contractually obligated to keep any of these players. That rolled off the tongue beautifully. Where do we want to go with this position? Has Sidney Jones, a former second round pick out of Washington, who suffered a heartbreaking pre-draft injury, who then missed all his rookie year, which was somehow seen as a pass because everyone knew that was going to be okay, and then went on to miss even more games in his second year. Is he the guy we're going to look at now? Is this the guy that we can depend on? Because if he is, we still got a couple cheap seasons out of him. But is he durable enough? What if he goes down again? 
And if there is a still any kind of lingering doubt, that's when the Eagles will look at a, another free agent, maybe a rookie, maybe Avante Maddox, maybe LeBlanc, maybe Russell Douglas. All of these names are not only just competing for that same opportunity, but in this current offseason, they will be sniffing the door like a horny dog, right, at that nickel spot. And they've got to do something. Sidney Jones cannot afford to have an off-season hampered by injury. He can't afford to have a season hampered by injury where he's missing the occasional game. This has to be the prince who was promised from Sidney Jones right now. Because if it's not, and that's three years, he's already missed over a season's worth of games. Well, close to two. There's not much of an argument you can make. He was supposed to be an outside guy, an eventual CB1. He's been marginalised to a nickel roll because he can't hold his own outside. In the nickel through the first three games, he was awesome. Against the Vikings, allowed five completions on five receptions. Or five targets, even. He struggled mightily. And it wasn't good enough. There were other games as well where he notably started outside and struggled. He ended up with the 127th best rating, or worst I suppose, of any cornerback in the NFL according to Pro Football Focus. It's not enough. And when you've got someone like Avante Maddox who plugged outside, who plugged inside, who shook it all about and rolled at safety and was absolutely dominant. When you've got someone like Rasul Douglas, who then ends up leading the team in interceptions despite being the ugly duckling, although not now after his Juice Plus, uh, you know, recent hydration scheme, he's been excelling and selling them for 20% off with the code Saul at checkout. This is going to be a big season for Sidney Jones. And I really, really hope he balls out because I remember one of my first Eagles film room videos was Sidney Jones against the Dallas Cowboys. In week 17. And I thought he played excellently. He p- p- showed all of the traits that was so strong coming out of college. And then he's just been hit by injury after injury. And he hasn't been able to shake that label. He's been inconsistent when on the field. And there's only so many times the term teething problems is going to come into account. When Rasul Douglas, who was drafted that same year, who has been overlooked and overlooked and is now on Juice Plus Pills for Women... I mean, he's not, but, you know, for for context's sake. Rasul Douglas, who comes in like a tackling machine in 2018, blows up screenplays, contributes in the run game, and doesn't whiff on tackles like Sidney Jones, who leads the team in interceptions, who is a bigger cornerback, who does have a bigger wingspan, who does go up and make plays on jump balls, and is not limited by a six-foot frame, is going to start turning heads. How many more times can you say, well, he's had an Achilles problem. Well, he got injured in the pre-draft three years ago. It doesn't matter. When you get to training camp and you have got a competitive field that big and you've got an opportunity to have one last audition for a starting role, a year-long audition for a starting role, if you cannot make the cut, if you can't get on the field, The Eagles may be forced to look another way or just have him as a depth CB or keep him in the nickel, which um, unless he's going to put up Patrick uh, Patrick Robinson level numbers, you're not getting value from that second round pick at all. You're really, really not. And it's a real shame. So this season is of the utmost importance, the utmost importance for the young Eagles cornerback. And again, his ceiling is high. The potential is there, but the excuses will now run thin. And Corey Unlin's secondary, one way or another, whether it's this season or next offseason, are going to dictate the path of Sidney Jones. Is he going to be a starter? Or is he going to end up buried on the depth chart? And potentially, the first bust of this Howie Roseman, Doug Peterson era, not named Danell Pumphrey. Only time will tell, guys, but I need you to let me know down in the comments if you're on YouTube what you think of all the stuff discussed on today's podcast. And of course, if you haven't subscribed on Apple Podcasts yet, please click the link in the description, rate five stars, leave a review from myself, Liam Jenkins. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to me ramble about the Eagles. I can't ever tell you how much it means to me. We'll see you next week for another edition of the Outside Insider Podcast. Take care.